The Lord be with you. Welcome to our service today. It's the second Sunday after Epiphany, uh, and we continue to uh, see our Lord uh, revealed, unveiled before us. That's what's going on in Epiphany, uh, is, is Jesus is revealed to us as the Savior that He's come to be. Um, most of the time this year, we're going to be reading from the Gospel of Mark, but for today, and there's a few other Sundays this year where we'll, where we'll do this as well, but today uh, we're going to read from the Gospel of John, uh, and we'll get a little snippet of a story where Jesus calls some of his first disciples, and we'll have an interesting conversation uh, between Jesus uh, and a man named Nathaniel, and we'll see uh, what Jesus is revealed to be there uh, as he talks with Nathaniel, and, we'll re and we will rejoice in what that means for us uh, as he's revealed to us as well. Uh, there are just a couple of things I want to mention before we get started. The first is that you'll want to have the order of service handy uh, to be able to follow along. It's in the email uh, or right in the, the description below the YouTube video if you're just watching on YouTube. Um, couple other announcement type things. First is we had planned, uh, or I had been hoping at least, to offer Holy Communion to you, uh, those of you who desired to receive it, uh, every other Sunday during this current lockdown. Uh, but right now it looks like, we, at least for the time being, we won't be able to do that after the government changed some of the rules and regulations this past week. So if you had been planning to come to communion either here at Christ our Savior or at Redeemer, that's not going to be able to happen in the foreseeable future anyways, and if anything changes with that, I'll be sure to let you know. Uh, the other thing is a reminder just about offering. Um, as is always the case when we're not able to gather together like this, the two best ways to send in your offering are either in the mail, you can mail them to Christ our Savior, Redeemer people and Christ our Savior people, you can mail your offering here to Christ our Savior, uh, or if you choose to give online, you can use the Lutheran Church Canada link that was in the email uh, where you can do that as well. Thank you uh, to those of you who have already done that. We've received some of your offerings, and they are uh, most certainly a blessing uh, once again during this, th this lockdown time. And the only other thing to mention is, once again, we have an addition to our prayer list. Uh, here at Christ Our Savior, one of our members is Jamie Pullman. Uh, Jamie Pullman's father passed away uh, this past week, so we'll keep Jamie and his family in our prayers as they mourn the passing of, uh, of Jamie's father. So uh, that, I think, is all I need to say before we get started. So we're going to begin uh, with the opening sentences on page one of the Order of Service. O oh Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. Make haste, O oh God, to deliver me. Make haste to help me, O oh Lord. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Praise to you, O oh Christ. Alleluia. We join to sing our opening hymn, number 807, When Morning Gilds the Skies. Oh. 
We continue with the psalm on page 2 of the order of service. The Christ has appeared to us. O come, let us worship him. O Lord, you have searched me and know me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern, discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all together. You hem me in behind and before and, you lay, and lay up your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high, I cannot attain it. Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to the heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. The Christ has appeared to us. O come, let us worship him. The Old Testament reading for the second Sunday after Epiphany is from 1 Samuel chapter 3. And in this reading, we're going to hear the story of how Samuel, while still a young man, uh, is called to be a prophet of the Lord. And we're going to hear how a man named Eli, the priest who uh, is taking care of Samuel and, and under whom Samuel is serving, instructs Samuel how to respond when he hears uh, the, the words of the Lord. And the instructions are to say, speak, Lord for your servant hears. And in that sense, uh, Samuel becomes a, a model for us, for us to follow as we hear God's word and respond saying, speak, Lord, for your servant hears. So we read from 1 Samuel chapter 3, beginning with verse 1. The young man Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli, and the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no frequent vision. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his own place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called Samuel and said, and he said, here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call, lie down again. So he went and lay down. And the Lord called again, Samuel. And Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call, my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time. And he arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the young man. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go, lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. And the Lord came and stood, calling as at, the, at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant hears. Then the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I am about to do a thing in Israel at which the two ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. On that day I will fulfill against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. And I declare to him that I am about to punish his house forever for the iniquity that he knew because his sons were blaspheming God and he did not restrain them. Therefore I swear to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned by, for by sacrifice or offering forever. Samuel lay until morning. Then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord, and Samuel was afraid to tell the vision to Eli. But Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son. And he said, Here I am. And Eli said, What was it that he told you? Do not hide it from me. May God do so to you and more also if you hide anything from me of all that he told you. So Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. And he said, it is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. And Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and let none of his words fall to the ground. 
And all Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, knew that Samuel was established as a prophet of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle reading is from 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 6. Uh, and in his reading, Paul speaks about our bodies and our bodies as, as objects that are valuable to God, objects that he will raise from the dead, objects that even now that he comes to live in and dwell in with his Holy Spirit. And so Paul calls on us here to glorify God in our bodies. We read from 1 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning with verse 12. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be enslaved by anything. Food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I take them, take the body, the member, the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two will become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the first chapter. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, You are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We join in the responsory in the middle of page four of the order of service. Forever, O Lord, your word is firmly set in the heavens. Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. We confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Uh, 
How are you guys doing? Good. Good. Can we say hi to everyone at home? Hi. hi. Especially to the other kids who are at home. All right. So today in our Old Testament reading, we heard a story about someone named Samuel and how God called Samuel to be a prophet. Samuel heard God's voice one night when he was sleeping. What do, you, do you think it would be cool to like hear God like that? Mm -hmm. To hear God's voice? Yeah, that'd be pretty cool, right? Yeah, but we can't. Not, not quite like that, huh? Yeah. Samuel heard God's voice, and then he thought it was a man named Eli who was calling him, so he went to go talk to Eli, and Eli told him, uh, told him that, no, it's God who's calling you. And he said, when you hear God talking to you, you can say, speak, Lord, for your servant hears, or your servant is listening. And that's what Samuel did. And so Samuel said, speak, Lord, your servant hears, your servant is listening, and he heard God's voice. Now, Rachel, you're kind of right that we don't really hear God like that talking to us when we're sleeping or something, right? Not quite like Samuel did. But we do get to hear God talking to us. Where do we hear God talking to us? In the Bible. In the Bible. God talks to us in the Bible. That's God's word. And so when we hear the words of the Bible and we read them for ourselves, God is speaking to us. So we can say, speak, Lord, for your servant hears. Right? And we can know that God talks to us. And this is the really special thing about the story about Samuel. How old do you think he was when God talked to him? 25. 25? Mm, good guess. What do you think, Hannah? Seven. Seven? Oh. Livia, what do you think? Don't know? Well, I think Hannah is probably the closest. The Bible tells us he was still just a boy. He was a kid. And God came and spoke to him when he was a kid. Are you guys kids? Some of our friends at home are, at home are kids. So, Does God talk to kids? Yes. Yeah. God talks, doesn't just talk to grown-ups. God talks to kids too. God talks to you, he talks to you, he talks to you, he talks to me, he talks to all these people. And he talks to us when we read his words in the Bible. And so we want to learn today to say, just like Samuel said, speak, Lord, even though we're a kid, your servant is listening. We're hearing your words, okay? So can we pray, God and ask, or pray to God and ask him to help us do that? Okay, let's pray. Dear God, you speak to us, whether we're kids or whether we're grown-ups, however old we are, you speak to us through your words in the Bible. Help us pay attention to those words so that we hear the good news about Jesus, how much you love us and save us from our sins, and help us to say, speak, Lord, for your servant hears. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's say bye-bye bu to our friends at home. All right, bye-bye. Bye-bye.
Dear saints in Christ, grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The right ladder makes all the difference. That's the lesson that I learned back in December as I tack tackled the annual task of putting up the Christmas lights at our house. The right ladder makes all the difference. You see, before this year, I didn't actually own a ladder, not a proper ladder anyways. Instead, every year when it came time to put up the Christmas lights, I would borrow one of the ladders from here at Christ our Savior, take it home and use it to put up the Christmas lights at my house. Now, on the one hand, that arrangement actually worked pretty well because it meant that I didn't have to spend any money on a ladder, and I'm kind of cheap. And no one else was really using the ladders around here anyway, so it wasn't really a problem. On the other hand, however, this arrangement didn't work always quite so well because neither of the ladders that we have here at Christ our Savior is really actually the right ladder for the job. We have two ladders here at Christ our Savior, one step ladder and one extension ladder. The step ladder is the one that I brought home most often and used to put up my Christmas lights, but it was just barely tall enough for the job. When I used it, I would often end up standing on pretty much the second to last step and kind of up on my tiptoes at that with my arm reached just about as high as it could possibly reach in order to clip those lights onto the eaves troughs. I was up there tottering back and forth and leaving Leah and the kids and everybody else who happened to be walking by on the sidewalk feeling rather nervous that perhaps I was going to plummet to my doom. It was less than ideal. The extension ladder, on the other hand, was more than tall enough to reach up to my eaves troughs. It's tall enough to get up to the roof here at Christ our Savior, far higher than my roof at home. But it was actually too tall to fit into our minivan. In order to get it home, I would have had to have taken all of the seats out of the van and drive home with the rear gate, the back door of the van, bouncing open there with this ladder hanging out the back. It was doable, but not ideal either. Simply put, neither ladder was the right ladder for the job. And as a result, the job was more complicated than it needed to be. This year, however, rather than borrowing a ladder from the church, I bit the bullet and bought a ladder for myself. A nice multi-purpose ladder that can work as a step ladder and as an extension ladder and folds up nicely so that it fits not just into our minivan but even into my car, which is far smaller even than that. And when it came time to put up the lights at home, I was amazed at the difference that the right ladder makes. This year, using my own ladder, the right ladder for the job, the ladder that I bought specifically for this job, the job putting up the Christmas lights, wasn't nearly as big of a nuisance as it usually is. The right ladder made all of the difference. Now, this may sound strange, but the lesson that I learned putting up my Christmas lights this year, that the right ladder makes all the difference, is also the lesson that Jesus is teaching us in our gospel reading today, or at least one of the lessons that Jesus is teaching us in our gospel reading today. The kind of ladder Jesus is talking about, however, is not the kind of ladder that you use to put up your Christmas lights. But before we get to that, before we get to our gospel reading, we need to lay some groundwork here first. So way back in 1928, almost 100 years ago, a German theologian by the name of Adolf Kaberle wrote a book called The Quest for holiness. And in this book, Caberly identified what he called three ladders, three broken ladders, that he argued all human beings, all human beings throughout human history, and all human beings wherever they happen to live on this place we call Earth, all human beings, he argued, try to climb these ladders, or at least one of these three ladders, as we seek after holiness and try to lift ourselves up to God, up to heaven. The three ladders, he said, are moralism, mysticism, and rationalism, three different isms. Moralism, Caberly said, is the ladder of the will. 
It's the ladder by which people try to lift themselves up to God by doing good works and and living good lives. Mysticism, he said, is the ladder of the emotions, of the heart, we could say. It's the ladder by which people try to lift themselves up to God by looking inside, by looking into their own hearts and conjuring up the right feelings in there. And finally, Caberly said, rationalism, the third ladder, is the ladder of the mind. It's the ladder by which people lift themselves up, by, up to God by trying to obtain some kind of perfect knowledge, whether it's perfect knowledge about God or perfect knowledge about the world or about the universe or perfect knowledge about something else, this, that, or the other thing. There were these three ladders, he said, that every human being is trying to use these ladders to, to climb up to God. Now, the truth of what Caberly said in this book a hundred years ago, the truth that human beings all over the world throughout human history, since the fall into sin, at least anyways, have been trying to climb up at least one of these three ladders up to God, the truth of this is almost indisputable. In fact, I would say it is indisputable. All you have to do if you want to see people climbing up these ladders, one of these three ladders, into heaven, is look around the world at the religions of the world. Muslims and Jews, for example, seek to climb up the moralism ladder. For them, obedience to God, living a moral life, is the way to climb up to God. When it comes to mysticism, You need look no further than the religions that we call the ones that are from the East. Hinduism and Buddhism, for example, are two religions that seek to find God and holiness by looking inside and trying to achieve some kind of perfect inner peace or something like that in their hearts. And rationalism? Well, that's basically just the religion of modern North American culture and society. Knowledge, perfect knowledge, usually based on scientific discovery, is the way most folks around us, the folks we interact with on an everyday basis, try to lift themselves up to God, even if they don't exactly see it that way. It's important we realize, however, that it's not just the people out there, who, the, the people who practice other religions, who try to climb up these ladders to God. Christians do it too. We do it too. Satan tempts us to think that if we try hard enough, if we do enough good, then we can climb our way up to heaven or at least earn something good from God. That's why we're all constantly inclined to kind of keep a tally of the good that we do and pat ourselves on the back when we do something good because we think that we've gone up another notch on the moralism ladder. And it's not just with moralism either. Satan also tempts us to look into our hearts and try to find God there, to to climb up to God in our feelings or emotions. And so that's why we try and conjure up these good, positive feelings inside of us or something like that. Or why when we're not feeling so good, we spend hours and hours thinking and worrying about why we feel this, that way, or the other way, and we wonder what it all means. We're climbing the mysticism ladder trying to get up to God with our emotions. And last but not least, Satan certainly tempts us to idolize knowledge, just like our culture does, and make that, make knowing things, knowing the right things, to be the most important thing in our lives. The thing about these ladders, moralism, mysticism, and rationalism, is that they're not evil or bad in and of themselves. It's not bad for people to want to be good people. Far from it. And it's not bad for people to want to feel emotionally close to God. Or it's not bad for people to want to pursue knowledge and grow in their understanding of the world or anything like that. Those, in all honesty, are all good things. The problem with these ladders, however, is they don't reach nearly as high as we human beings tend to think that they do. Moralism, for example, can't reach up high enough to get us to God. After all, the scriptures tell us all have sinned and fall short 
of the glory of God. So despite our best efforts, we can't climb up high enough. We have fallen short. Moralism, that ladder, can't get you up to God. Neither can mysticism. Looking into your hearts, the emotions that you find in there won't get you closer to God. Because as Jesus said, out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, and slander. That's what we're going to find in there if we go look. And we're not going to find a, you know, God or find some way to get closer to God. We're going to find our own sin. And finally, the rationalism ladder, the ladder of the mind, it's not going to get you there either because God's ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And as St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God for they are folly to him and he does not understand them. Our minds can't comprehend the things of God. We can't reach up that high with our sinful human minds. As I said, these three ladders that human beings everywhere and always are trying to climb up to get to God are broken ladders. This is how Adolf Kaberly summarizes all of this in his book. He says, moralism, mysticism, and rationalism. These are the three ladders on which men continually seek to climb up to God. A storming of heaven that is just as pathetic in its unceasing effort as it is in its final futility. The effort to climb up to God in heaven on these ladders, Caberly says it's pathetic and it's futile. It's exhausting. It's like trying to climb up on, on a treadmill or something like that. The ladder just keeps going and going and going and it doesn't work. And that, finally, brings us to our gospel reading today. Because in our gospel reading today, we heard about Jesus calling some of his first disciples. And in particular, we hear about this interaction that Jesus has with this man named Nathaniel. And speaking to Nathaniel, Jesus brings to our attention the one true ladder that carries us up to God. Nathaniel, this man Nathaniel, he's been brought to see Jesus by his friend Philip. After listening to John the Baptist preach and after listening to Jesus a little bit too, Philip is convinced that, that this man, Jesus of Nazareth, the supposed son of Joseph, he's convinced that he is the Messiah, the Savior, the one that Moses in the Old Testament and all the prophets wrote about too. And Philip is so convinced about this that he wants his friend Nathaniel to believe in Jesus as well. But when Philip came and told Nathanael about Jesus, when he came to Nathanael and told him that he had found the Messiah, the Savior, Nathanael was a little skeptical, at least skeptical that Jesus could possibly be the guy. Because Nathanael knew that the Savior was supposed to come from Bethlehem, and Philip said that this Jesus guy was from Nazareth, and Philip saw that that doesn't, doesn't line up. But Philip was relentless. He didn't argue with Nathaniel or anything like that, which is something we can learn, by the way, when people disagree with us or question us about faith-type things. We don't have to argue with them. Instead, we can do what Philip said. He just simply said to Nathaniel, come and see then. Just come and see. And he invited him to come and see Jesus. So they went. They went to see Jesus. And when they did, when they went to see Jesus, Jesus taught them. And today still teaches us the very same thing, that the right ladder makes all the difference. Listen again to how John says this interaction between Jesus and Nathaniel went down. Listen to what John says. He says, Jesus saw Nathaniel coming toward him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. Nathaniel said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of God. Of man. 
Now, if you didn't hear anything about ladders in there in what I just read to you, don't feel bad. Jesus didn't use the word ladder even once when he was talking to Nathaniel. And it's easy for us, especially for us who don't necessarily know the Old Testament scriptures quite as well as maybe we should, or at least as well as Christians used to. It's easy for us to miss the lesson that Jesus is teaching here. But Nathaniel and Philip, they wouldn't have missed it. They would have caught on to exactly what Jesus meant when he said, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. When Nathaniel and Philip heard that from Jesus, they would have caught on right away and realized that he was referring to an Old Testament story, the Old Testament story of Jacob. The Old Testament story of Jacob, who in Genesis chapter 28 was running away from his brother and was running off to a foreign country, going there in hopes of finding a wife and was kind of venturing off in his life for the first time on his own and lay down one night with a stone for his pillow and had a dream. And in his dream, he saw heaven opened and he saw the angels of God ascending and descending on a ladder. And he took this to mean that this was the place of God's presence, that God was present in this place where he had laid his head. And so he called that place Bethel, which means house of God. Now for Philip and Nathaniel, as they heard Jesus say these things, that they would see the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man, they would have figured this out right away. They would have realized that Jesus was basically saying that he was the ladder from way back in Joseph's, or Jacob's dream. The ladder in Joseph's dream that came down from heaven to earth. The ladder on which the angels of God ascended and descended. Nathaniel and Philip would have realized that Jesus was saying that he had come to bring the blessings of God our Father down to earth. Rather than having us climb up to God by our moral efforts or through our emotions or by our pursuit of knowledge, Jesus is the ladder that brings heaven itself, God himself, down to us. He brought the banquet of heaven down to a wedding at Cana, transforming 180 gallons of water into the best wine that any one of the guests at that wedding had ever tasted. And he brings that same banquet to you and to me when we celebrate the Lord's Supper. He brought the healing of heaven, down to earth by healing the sick and the injured, opening the eyes of the blind and even raising the dead. And he brings that healing to us today as well, healing our sin-sick souls. He brings the verdict of heaven down to you, the verdict of God concerning your sin, the verdict which, verdict which says to you, your sins are forgiven. And to all who are tired and worn out from climbing, to those who have toiled and come up short on the ladders of moralism, mysticism, and rationalism, to those who have maybe even fallen off the ladders, who are stuck halfway up the ladder, and who can't seem to muster the strength to take another step up the ladder, he brings down the quiet and the peace, the rest of heaven itself, and he says, come unto me all you who labor and, have, and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Dear friends, the right ladder makes all the difference. And Jesus is the right ladder. Not the ladder that you have to climb, but the ladder that God climbs down, the ladder on which God climbs down to you and brings his blessings to you. So we rejoice today in Epiphany to have revealed to us the truth that Jesus is the ladder, the ladder that brings salvation down to us. And we give thanks to God that we don't have to climb to him, but that he comes to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Now may the peace of God, which passes all our understanding, 
Guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus to life that is everlasting. Amen. We continue with the prayers on page 6 of the Order of Service. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Almighty and everlasting God, who governs all things in heaven and on earth, mercifully hear the prayers of your people and grant us your peace through all our days. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. O Lord, you have called us into the fellowship of your Son, Jesus Christ. By his incarnation and his great work of salvation, heaven is open to us and the blessings of heaven are brought down to us. Give us boldness to share with others the joy that we have in Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious, gracious God, preserve your church, your church here and throughout the world. Send forth laborers into your harvest to preach and teach your holy word and sustain those whom you have sent. We especially pray for Timothy, our, our synod president, Marvin, our regional pastor, and Kevin, our circuit counselor. Make all Christians bold in their confession of faith and unwavering in prayer. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, you have given us your Holy Spirit, making our bodies your temple and knitting us together in the mystical body of your Son, Jesus Christ. Grant that all we do with our bodies may glorify you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, every lawful authority on earth comes from you. Uphold in righteousness and health our nation and its leaders. Give wisdom and strength to Justin, our Prime Minister, Doug, our Premier, and all public servants, including our armed forces, police, and first responders, and all doctors and healthcare personnel. Send peace and happiness in our time. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O oh God, we lift up before you all who are sick or suffering, especially those in our parish prayer list, Irma, Pastor Winger, Stephen, Robert, Becca, Gerald, Herta, and Annette. Bring healing and comfort, strength and patience and certainty to all who are in need. Receive our thanks for your constant watchfulness over us and your merciful kindness towards us. In every sorrow and every joy, do not let our eyes be drawn away from your kindness in Christ Jesus, by whose grace and forgiveness alone we receive every blessing. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O Lord, you rule over life and over death, and you have called to yourself your servant, Harold. We pray that you would be with Jamie and his family as they mourn his father's passing and give them your peace. Assure them in the hope of the resurrection to eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. All these things and whatever else you know that we need, grant us, Father, for the sake of him who died and rose again and now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, you have safely brought us to the beginning of this day. Defend us in the same with your mighty power and grant that this day we fall into no sin, neither run into any kind of danger, but that all our doings being ordered by your governance may be righteous in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. We join to sing our closing hymn, number 895, Now Thank We All Our God.